Okay, thank you for everyone's uh, patience and time at that time of the day. So I'll be as clear and um, as quick as I can. <laughs> um, so I will, of course, at the start of this, uh, acknowledge um, the, the, the help I've had from my supervisors, uh, Jessica and John. But uh, it is with thanks to uh, as opposed to co authors, because they haven't had a chance to bet it. So, so they, may not, they might not think this is very good. And then I, so I'm speaking on behalf of me, not them yet, but if you think it's rubbish, then point your attention towards me, not them. That's, that's all it says there. So, participation in uh, school-based physical activity, norm circles, and the influence of peers. So, um, uh, what I think really uh, the, the point of this is, and if I was going to break it down really quickly with a, with a quick summary, it would be um, about the, the, perhaps a, a gap in the literature um, which doesn't address how important friends are in people's engagement with, uh, with PE, um, health and PE in, in lessons, but also in school sport more, more broadly. Um, and secondly, uh, the theoretical use of uh, norm circles, which will be, um, I can elaborate on soon. But um, so I'd imagine this is, this is going to be quite, quite a new theory to, to, to most people here. I have not seen it used much. But um, it's, it's really basic, it's really simple, so I shall, um, it's just because it's late in the day, don't worry, it's, it's not a new theory. I won't be talking about assemblages or anything like that. Um, so so I'll, I'll break it down quite quickly. Um, so here's the overview. So what is this about? I think it's a theoretical paper, um, more, than, more than anything else. Um, uh, and I'm offering an explanation of how social structures ha uh, help shape people's engagement with health and physical education. I think it adds an account of social structure using this theory um, that's located in identifiable human action. So part of this theory, it comes from a criticism of a kind of loose description of social structure, institutions, society, um, and kind of aims for a more precise, perhaps rigorous description of what we actually mean by social structure. So that's what it, it kind, of, kind of adds there. And for um, HP research, I think... You know, possibly this is, um, it might suggest, and the way I'm applying it, that peer groups ought to be better accounted for. So the theory of norm circles isn't necessarily about peer groups, but the way I'm applying it here might, um, might have some relevance. Um, so, a picture. Because most of my slides are like this, so apologies. So here's a big picture for you. Um, this is um, primary peer, okay? The, the way I'm kind of explaining it, I think it perhaps looks like this, everyone wanting to get involved, everyone enthusiastic, and we're addressing the question of how come you get to a little bit later and you get a situation, this is from St. Trinian's, uh, the, the film, which looks a little bit like this, and the point of this isn't that it's uh, people are less engaged, the point is that uh, different groups and different types of kids emerge, I think, more so in, in secondary school than they do in primary school. So in this picture, you've got the kind of gothic girl uh, on, on the floor, you've got the uh, academic girl uh, with her head in a the book there, the prim and proper goody two-shoes at the back, and you've got the kind of popular makeup, made-up girl um, in the front there. And obviously, you could do this for, for, for boys as well, so I'm not trying to um, stereotype just girls' lessons. But So these are obviously uh, caricatures, and I recognise that. I think there's something to be said in these, these groups that emerge through, through schooling. Um, so obviously much research has investigated pupil engagement and increased attention on it perhaps because of the health enhancing nature of PE. But you know, besides that, I think all teachers in all lessons would be interested in, in understanding why kids are engaged in their, in their lessons anyway. Um, so the basic thesis here is that peer groups have a part to play in the dynamic milieu of processes that influence whether or not young people engage in HP and school sport. So this is nothing new, and uh, in, in talking to people throughout the, the, the week about what this presentation is going to be about, you know, it's kind of one of those things which is quite, it might be perhaps quite obvious, um, and it's of no surprise to, to, to many people, but I think it's underreported and under-theorised um, and maybe with some, if you could help me out at the end of this, and you think, if you think that claim is, is wrong, and you think there's lots of research out there already, and because it's so common sense, maybe we don't need the research, then I'm happy to, happy to hear that at the end, and I'll start working on it, because that would be great. <laughs> um, so, and so, so w without this stuff, what I'm saying is we might lead to knowledge about HP, which relies on maybe broad sociological characteristics, um, and then also leading to maybe interventions that are based on these, 
these characteristics if we don't know anything else. Maybe educational structures, so if we identify the problem or the issues are, are around teaching methods or curricula, then, then we look to address them. Or maybe individual psychological characteristics, which comes up in the research as well. So of course all of these things are important, but maybe that we need to account for, for peers and peer groups as well. Um, so I'm putting forward a theoretical account on social structures aimed at explaining the influence of peers. So uh, this comes from a critical realist position. So I'm, going to go th I'm not going to go th spend too long on these, but, um, but basically the, the, the account of social structure within Bhaskar's uh, description of social structure and critical realism um, has a go at Durkheim, look, it's rubbish. Uh, has a go at Weber, it's rubbish. Has a go at Berger and Luckman. And then this is obviously proposes this one as being better. So to take that, um, you know, you, you can do what you want with that. But, um, uh, but, but, but this is what is, is proposed. And, and I, I do quite like this description. Um, you know, the idea that society and the individuals are always coexisting at the same time. Um, there's an opportunity for interaction between society and the individuals. Um, and there's reproduction and transformation occurs in this interaction between society and individuals. Um, what I'm looking at today isn't the whole process here. What I'm trying to explain with this theory of norm circles is an account of structure and that part, so the influence of structure on the individuals. Um, so that sort of, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I recognise I'm ignoring the rest of it today, um, but that's uh, just just a reductionist attempt to make, make some sense of it. Um, and I'm trying to outline what it is ontologically and kind of being, being a bit uh, careful about what we actually mean by this social structure. And essentially, what is the social ontology in HP or school sport? And, have a causative, and what causative properties do social structures have? So causative there is going to ring some alarm bells uh, w w with some people. This is in the language of, of, of critical realism. If you prefer influence or, or force or shaping or something like that, then please do, do read it with your, your own lenses. So um, the theory of norm circles, which, which attempts to identify this, which comes from Dave L. DeVos, who's a British sociologist, um, in, and mainly comes up in these two books, The Causal Power of Social Structures and The Reality of Social Construction. Reality and cause is already sending people out the room, but, it, but it's okay. Um, so, um, so, it, so, so it comes, it, it's, it's in these books, and I will um, attempt to explain it quickly now. Um, so look, a, a norm circle really then is a, it's a group of people who are committed to endorsing and enforcing a particular norm. Such groups are social entities, but with people as their parts. And because of the ways in which members of such groups interact, they have a causal power to produce a tendency for individuals to follow standardised practices. So it's a basic account of, of socialisation, um, really. Um, and so norms, norms, and, norms may relate to behaviours expected in certain cultural settings, um, but crucially, these norms cannot exist as rarefied Entities, you know, it's not as society itself, as I was explaining before. Um, they do not have causative powers in themselves. They act through, uh, through actual individual people. So um, here is some... some uh, I really like the emojis earlier, by the way, but um, so I, I've done a really bad job with some, some graphics here. But um, OK, so here, here we go. Here, here's, here's an agent. I, I like the Geraldo's examples earlier. I think Geraldo's really... And that example was, was, was perfect to, to, to kind of set up and start thinking about how peers, peers interact. So I've got a much more, more basic example here. But look, here's an agent saying, is it okay for a girl to play rugby? There are a number of people in the world who think it's okay for girls to play rugby. They exist everywhere in the world, uh, in the history of, of, of humankind. They, they, they make up what, what we call an actual norm circle. Now, they might, you know, might not meet them. The agent might not meet those people. Um, so what's referred to in the theory is a proximal norm circle of, of all the people who actually have a face-to-face -face interaction um, using subtle or more explicit ways, letting the agent know that it's okay to play for girls to play rugby. Now, now they are not the only people that have influence on that person's um, ability or, 
or uh, reflect and reflection on whether it's okay for a girl to play rugby because you may assume, just as one person said it, you may assume there's other people out in the world who have that same thought and they constitute what's called the imagined norm circle. So you have a proximal, um, imagined and actual norm circle. So here in this example you have a, a, a circle of people, a, a norm circle of people who think it's okay for girls to play rugby. Um, but it doesn't end there, of course, there will be an actual norm circle of people in the world who do not think it's okay to, for girls to play rugby. You might not meet all of them, but you might come across a proximal norm circle who, 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 who tell you it's not okay for girls to play rugby. And you might also imagine there are more people out there like that. There's not just four, there's more people out there like that. So the agent then has to make a decision and is very aware of the, the fact that these norm circles exist, these competing circles exist. Um, and over time, you, in reality, um, there is, these tend to make up clusters. Okay? So if they think certain things about girls, it's okay for girls to play rugby, they, you might assume they have a similar sort of norms that they, that they endorse as well. And they're called a norm set circle, but we won't go here too much into that. Um, so the emphasis then with this basic uh, approach is that norms are not abstract entities but materially present in the actions between actual people. While these interactions are often representative of wider cultural expectations, it is through actions of people that these norms are learnt. So like all causal powers in the critical realist model, normative institutions do not determine behaviour, if I can make that as clear as possible. And but they only contribute causally to its determination. So alongside other causal powers, they interact and they only tend to produce a given outcome. Um, so it's this, this idea of this awareness. Okay? It's an awareness that they are expected to observe certain norms. There might be, and there may be positive consequences if you observe them and negative ones if they don't. So things are multiply determined. So there might be obviously strong emotional drives um, it might be illegal to, to, to punch someone, but uh, in, in a, an emotional drive might still um, put someone to, to, to act that way. Or um, norms can be transgressed, so if someone thinks that no one's watching and they can get away with punching someone on a rugby pitch, then they may do that. Or that conflicting norms also exist. So some people might think, oh, they might get some respect from their friends if they end up punching someone. I'm not sure why I use punching as an example there. Um, I apologise, I do not endorse it. So, um, so what's the point of this? So, I, I think some of it's pretty straightforward. So, you know, it's it's it, it might speak generally from the socially concerned community that behaviours are social actions. Okay, so I think that's that that's one thing that's relevant about this. Um, subjectivities are intersectional. So, this is this is truly very the intersectionality is, is at the core of this idea. Um, people are in lots of different, or they are, are members of lots of different norm, um, norm circles. And possible norm circles exert causal powers and play a crucial part. So my kind of use of this is in asking the question, might peers act as important proximal norm circles, proximal and imagined norm circles for these kids in school who are wondering whether they should engage in this activity or not, and which kinds of activities might they engage in. So um, I'm going to whip through this because I'm running out of time, but um, I, th I do think this is more of a theoretical paper, and that this um, is sort of me cherry-picking some of the, the, the data that speaks to this and or, or illuminates this theoretical position, not necessarily grounded in the theory itself. So um, basically 29 participants, um, and there's a kind of lots of qualitative mixed uh, mixed methods um, as an approach. Um, so empirical examples to illuminate this then. So distinguishable social groups is the first idea and this is from um, the Breakfast Club. So uh, the, the, the participants in my study revealed that quite, quite clearly as you might expect there, there are different groups um, in school. We all get along but, but some people that you're always in four corners of wherever, and someone in, in this similar discussion, someone kind of drew. Uh, I asked to, to explain different groups, and he drew in the snow on the on the floor 
right, these are the boys, this is where the boys stand, this is where the girls stand. So you're starting to see the idea that, that the people are, are, are still in different groups. The same participant then elaborated on that and drew a picture of the playground. Um, year 9 football goes on here, Year 8 football. Pop for populars here, smokers just behind the bush there. Um, nerds all hang out there. And in the top right in the building, that's nerds only. So, so it's mostly sort of nerds there, but it's definitely nerds only in the, in the top right there. So we do have different types of people. Sporty and musical were terms to use to describe people. Um, and she used the analogy, I've got a foot in a few doors. So the, I think that's a revealing analogy when you think of different doors, different access to different uh, specific groups of people. Um, uh, and there's a quick little conversation about it. So, uh, you know, it's not like a stereotype. It's not like in the American movies, not in terms of identity. But they sort of dis disagreed in this. They identified emos as, as, a, as a label for one of the groups. Um, and they are sort of friendship groups, but they're sort of identity and in a category as well. So it's kind of loosely defined there. Um, uh, Kay hanging out with the smokers. And um, this is more the academic children and obviously I transcribed that with the exclamation marks so but that's, they almost sound like sarcastic but they were, they were really they were enthusiastic about this stuff Minecraft is, is a computer game uh, and history is awesome there so, um, so the second thing right they're in groups um, the second thing is they might act as proximal and imagine norm circles then so first of all they're in groups but do they actually exert some sort of causal power so sometimes it can be as simple as this, so you've got your friends that you play football, so you play football with them, don't you? Why do you, want to, why do you end up doing things? You know, I'm trying to say, do you enjoy it? Are you good at it? And they're saying, well, it's just because my mates do it. Um, that sort of thing came up quite a lot. Um, if after school, so if your mates are going out, then you end up going out. If, if your mates aren't going to go, then, then you're not going not to go out. You'll stay at home on the, on the laptop. Um, with football, I started because I, I wanted to and my friend was there. So this multiply determined, yeah? Um, this, this, this is a partial contribution of the, of the friends. Um, they also did this, uh, I got, got the participants to try and come up with a physical activity sort of interventions or school ideas to try and promote activity. And these two participants came up with a, a sports club at lunchtimes. They, they wanted it to be really inclusive. They went around saying, Anyone, anyone's welcome, all abilities. And um, what happened? Mainly just their friends turned up. So most of your friends turned up, they turned up as well. You know, Joe, the tall one. If Matt and James and Jordan, if they weren't there, then they wouldn't have come. So p pupils participated in accordance with the endorsement of friends. Um, so thinking about... Uh, so in reflecting on this sort of lack of success in terms of the inclusivity... Um, they said, one of the girls said she might come along, but they, they thought it was just a bunch of lads and she'd be the only girl, so it might be a bit intimidating. Uh, similarly, uh, they, they talked about the, the suggestion of maybe having a, a teenager's gym, maybe in, in school or outside of school, but you know, these very small, small subtle things whereby um, if there were people you knew there, but they weren't your friends, they anticipated it to be awkward in, in a number of ways. Um, so I think that the fact that they, they weren't going to be friends there um, had, some, had some influence. So pupils may have avoided participation in anticipation of encountering negative consequences. Um, and the final point there is um, that this was relevant for certain spaces as well. So these friends, they had um, uh, these, these groups exerted power and control over certain spaces in school as well. Um, again, you know, you think about attitude, you think about um, gender, you think about all, all these kind of things, and sometimes it's, it's, it's as simple as that. It doesn't matter whether they were good at playing football. If, if they didn't like them, they, then they told them not to, not to play. Um, in those words. Uh, so norm circles exert power in particular spaces. But to end on a kind of not all doom and gloom space, a bit of, a bit of agency... Um, I thought I'd, I'd show one example of the idea that norms can, of course, be rejected. So you have this situation here where you've got a, one of the girls, uh, two of the girls in, in, the, in the focus group were, were explaining that, really endorsing a, China, a kind of gender stereotype in terms of the sports. 
Um, yeah, like rugby and football are for boys and gymnastics and dance are for girls. Yeah, I've not done P before because it's too much of a boys sport. And then um, another fantastic girl piped up and said, I think everyone should be comfortable with doing everything. I think that football and all those male sports, I think everyone is capable of doing them. I don't think you should feel intimidated. I think over time people have stereotyped um, football, rugby, gymnastics and things into gender boundaries, but they're not at all. So rejecting it in that space, enacting that rejection or, uh, of, of, that, of that gender norm in that space. Um, and you know, if that was in action then, hopefully you'd think the other participants might reflect on that a little bit and then maybe, um, maybe uh, change their opinions of, of, that, um, of that norm. Um, similar example there. So in summary, I think peer groups may influence pupil engagement uh, with sport, uh, physical activity in school. Um, I think this might offer a possible theoretical framework um, and they have some normative power over individuals um, and individuals are the site of a number of intersecting social norms um, with each norm being endorsed and enforced by different norm circles. So this might provide a theoretical framework for sociological research into the future. I'm sort of imagining the possibility of, of asking people who are, who are the people in your school who tell you it's okay to do this? Who are the people who reject it? And, and actually I think there's the people would probably be able to name a lot of those people, um, and there will obviously be, be very difficult to do, but I think a lot of these people might be identifiable empirically. Um, and obviously this is, this is quite early, this is quite speculative, so I'll just see, um, see where it goes. Um, so it might help, help explain the failures of individualistic interventions. So do what you can to an individual, but actually there might be in certain groups which, which, which have those um, uh, powers over them. It might help explain the failures of demographic based interventions, so you know, do a kind of sports club for girls or something in school, but actually they might have a friendship group which is, includes girls and boys, so that might actually exclude some of their friends, perhaps. Um, teachers and health practitioners ought to consider accommodating friendship groups if they're trying to engage um, uh, children who might not be engaged in certain ways. And there might be work to reduce the anticipated negative effects. So I'm just kind of thinking of those, um, those concerns when you imagine that you might go into a space where you're going to encounter certain, certain rejections and some negative consequences. That imagined norm circle um, might be able to be adjusted and manipulated in, in some way. Um, thank you very much. Questions and comments and advice. Welcome.